the preaching of Jonah. According to Jewish tradition, Jonah was the son of the widow of Zarephath, whom Elijah raised from the dead. That's according to Jewish tradition. And that would be very interesting uh, there. 1 Kings 17, 8 through 24. In keeping with this thought, there are those who believe Jonah died in the fish's belly and was raised again. And uh, if you look at Jonah chapter 2, verse 2 and verse 6, it's where they uh, see, see that. So, uh, and of course, uh, the fact that the Lord was going to die. Jonah's testimony inside the fish is really a summary of the entire Bible. In despair, he cried out, Salvation is of the Lord. Uh, chapter 2, verse 9. Finally, the book of Jonah vividly dis demonstrates that out of all God's vast and marvelous created universe, the only speck of matter that can say no to its creator is man. The wind obeyed him, the ocean obeyed him, the fish obeyed him, the, the gourd obeyed him, uh, the worm obeyed him, uh, but he'll, he's given us uh, where we uh, can submit to him, yield to him, yeah. or go our own way. Uh, it's quoted from or alluded to nine times in four New Testament uh, books. So as we said, he's a real person, not just a character in a parable. And God sent him to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, to a people despised by the Jews. Jonah would rather that Nineveh be destroyed than that the city have an opportunity to repent and be spared. And the Assyrians were cruel people who showed no mercy to their enemies. Jonah wanted them out of the way. Yeah. Has you ever has somebody ever just bugged this living not somebody just like a pain and, and you're behind? I mean you just thought, man, if I never had to see this person again, that would be great, God. And then uh, <laughs> uh but that was uh, <laughs> that was uh, Jonah when he thought about the people of Nineveh, man. <laughs> now, he was on God's judgment. Yeah. And uh, but God's gonna give him salvation. Thank you, Lord. So, uh, it, so it's gonna emphasize God's grace both to Nineveh and to Jonah, because Jonah needed God's grace too. Okay, and we need God's grace as His servants. And though Nineveh was a wicked city, God gave the inhabitants opportunity to be spared. And God does want to save people, so he, he gives people that opportunity to, uh, to repent. Uh, so Jonah needed God's grace, of course, for salvation, but also as a servant because uh, he, was, he was a rebellious servant. God sent him to Nineveh, but he didn't want to go. But uh, he got things right. God forgave him. God used him and tenderly sought to help him overcome his anger. And uh, so uh, we can be angry. Even as Christians, we can be angry Christians, you know, and angry people. And God certainly wants us to deal with those type of things. Now there's a righteous anger. Jesus had a righteous anger. And a righteous anger is against sin. Okay. Uh, sin itself but you see though God had a righteous anger against sin he still had a love to be gracious and merciful to save the sinner uh, God's the main person in the story though if we just get our eyes on uh, and think boy the book of Jonah is about Jonah okay or the book of Jonah is about the well then uh we're going to miss the fact that the, or the book of Job is about Nineveh. We're going to miss the, that it's really about God. That's the Bible. It's God. It's God working in man. It's God operating uh, through man. Uh, and uh, 
God wants us to uh, respond to His Word uh, and to His will in obedience. So we're going to learn that uh, through here. All right, so uh, chapter 1, Jonah's refusal. Uh, so God's going to have to be patient with him, chapter 1. Uh, God commanded him to go to Nineveh and warn uh, that wicked city that divine judgment would fall unless it repented. Verse 2. And then the prophet's objection, Jonah disobeyed and set sail to Joppa for Tarshish. Verse 3. So he goes in the opposite direction. Jonah foolishly attempted the impossible to flee from God's presence. Psalm 139 teaches us that's not you can't do that. He purchased the fare to Tarshish, or Spain, from the port of Joppa. And this port is significant for some eight centuries later, another Jewish preacher, as we said, would receive a similar command to share the gospel with some Gentiles in Acts 10. And uh, so uh, he wasn't a coward, okay? China, he wasn't a coward, he wasn't afraid. Um, but uh, he didn't, he disliked, he knew what God was going to do, okay? So uh, he disobeys, and God created a great storm which threatened to sink the ship Jonah was in. After praying to their gods and throwing the cargo overboard, the terrified sailors awakened Jonah and asked him what they should do. He instructed them to cast him into the sea, explaining that his act of disobedience had brought upon about the storm in the first place. Wow. You get rid of me, you get rid of your problem. <laughs> so he's thrown overboard, causing the raging sea to become calm immediately. Um, verse 15 and 16 of chapter 1. Then uh, the great fish prepared by God swallowed Jonah. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Okay. Uh, Dr. J. Vernon McGee wrote, of, of all the miracles in the Bible, none is better known or has raised more eyebrows than this one. The fish here is... Not the hero of the story, neither is it its villain. The book is not even about a fish. The fish is among the props. It does not occupy the star's dressing room. Let us distinguish between the essentials and the incidentals. Incidentals are the fish, the gourd, the east wind, the boat, and Nineveh. The essentials and the essential is Jehovah God. So the question is often asked as to whether a whale could actually swallow a man in the first place. And it should be pointed out that nowhere in there, uh, they won't say here in the original language, but we go to the Lord's Word. But is it uh, possible? Yes. And through history, uh, we know that uh, well, that's true not only with Jonah, but others. Um, one of the most striking instances comes from Francis Fox, 63 years of engineering, who reported that, that this incident was carefully investigated by two scientists, one of whom was uh, uh, the Parville, the scientific editor of the journal. And, uh, but in February 1891, the whaling ship Star of the East was in the vicinity of the Falkland Islands. And the lookout sighted a large sperm whale three miles away. Two boats were lowered. In a short time, one of the harpooners was enabled to spear the creature. The second boat also attacked the whale, but was then upset by a lash of its tail so uh, that its crew fell into the sea. One of them was drowned, but the other, James Bartley, simply disappeared without a trace. After the whale was killed, the crew set to work with axes and spades removing the blubber. They worked all day and part of the night. The next day they attached some tackle to the stomach which was hoisted on deck 
the sailors were startled by something in it which gave spas uh, spasmodic signs of life and inside was found the missing sailor doubled up and unconscious. He was laid on the deck and treated to a bath of seawater which soon revived him. At the end of the third week he had entirely recovered from the shock and resumed his duties. His face and neck and hands were bleached to a deadly whiteness and took on the appearance of parchment. Uh, Bartley affirmed that he would probably have lived inside his house of fish until he starved, for he lost his senses through fright and not through lack of air. And uh, what I want you to get from that is the way he looked when he came out. Okay, so say this, Jonah, the appearance is going to change. Okay, so when he's brought, when he comes to Nineveh, that's going to immediately draw people's eyes, right? Okay, so they're going to want to hear from this guy. Or, wow, I mean, what, what is it with you, you know, looking at him and stuff? So now he got a story to tell, okay? People love, people love a good story, a good illustration, <laughs> okay? So see how God takes even Jonah's disobedience and uses it uh, and, and as he turns him to be obedient, turns it to uh, use it in uh, his evangelistic uh, calling there. So uh, chapter 2 is a demonstration of God's power. Uh, he uh, prays from the belly of the fish. Uh, so some of the language there seemed to indicate he actually died and was later resurrected by God. Note his phrases, out of the belly of hell, or Sheol, verse 2. Thou brought up my life from corruption, verse 6. <coughs> my soul fainted within me, verse 7. So some would believe uh, that took place. Uh, while God could have done this, the simple context approach would suggest Jonah did not die but was at the point of death. Okay. Because uh, there is going to be one that will literally die, but he'll be raised again. Now, on two occasions, Jonah referred to that holy temple, verse 4 and verse 7. He pointed his prayer in this direction. Jonah was no doubt calling to remember Solomon's temple dedication some 150 years back before this time. And then one can almost picture the pathetic and praying prophet as he sloshed and slid around with the seaweeds wrapped around his head. And the backslider is often forced to wear a strange uh, uh, halo to, and uh, to cry out. But I tell you what, you in some like situation, it's going to make you cry out if you have any relationship with God. Jonah mentioned the scientific fact, a total, fact totally unknown by human resources in that day when he spoke of the mountains that rise from off the ocean floor. And this is just another little proof that the Bible is indeed the very Word of God. So uh, God revealed... Being, the Word of God, God revealed things that only scientists caught up to later, okay, and through. So the prophet uh, 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 has, has, you could say, has to obey, or he's brought to a place of willing to obey now. Okay, uh, I better do what God says. And a uh, great spiritual awakening took place. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it uh, the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Okay. So here, this was the message. It's coming. Judgment's coming. Uh, 
Now this, when you see in the Bible, it says that God repented or God relented. What does it mean? It doesn't. It means God changed because man changed. God was going to bring judgment, okay, upon Nineveh. But Nineveh, it's just like this. This is what's going to happen if you go this way. But if you'll go this way, this is what will happen, okay? So when they repented and got right, then God stayed the judgment. Now, eventually in time, of course, uh, uh, judgment would come because, as you know, there's a cycle. And even when there's a great spiritual awakening or a great revival, that uh, it's like this cycle. Then they, you know, start turning downwards, <clears throat> have to come be broken again. Okay. Uh, so uh, Nineveh lay on the eastern side of the Tigris and was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of the cities of antiquity. It had uh, 1,200 towers, each 200 feet high, and its wall was 100 feet high. And of such breadth that three chariots could drive on its on it abreast. It was 60 miles in circumference uh, and could within its walls grow corn enough for its population of 600,000. Uh, when I was in Chicago on a mission trip, I met a guy who said he was, his claim was that he was a descendant of Nineveh, which got caught my interest because we were witnessing, we began to witness to him. And he said he was a Christian and uh, that he was a descendant of Nineveh. So that sort of got me thinking a little bit, you know, and uh, pretty, pretty uh, neat there. Uh, Yet forty days and none of us shall be overthrown. Forty is often the number of testing in the Bible, as indicated uh, when the flood rains continued forty days and uh, was time. Moses spent forty days on Mount Sinai. The twelve spies searched out Palestine for forty days. Israel wandered for forty years in the wilderness. Jesus was tempted forty days. Forty days elapsed between his resurrection and ascension. So a time of testing. Okay. And uh, so uh, a great revival takes place, uh, one of the greatest in human history, uh, as a result of Jonah's preaching, which was really a result of what? Of God's grace and mercy. And... Uh, uh, God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. This is chapter 3, verse 10. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. <clears throat> so why did God change? Because they changed. This was always the way. If you do it this way, this is the results that you can have. You know, you can have a great blessing. But if you decide to do it this way, then it's going to have to be judgment. Okay? And that's simply, when you see that in the Bible, what it means. Well, Jonah pouted. And uh, so he, he pouts. You see that in chapter 4. And uh, God's dealing with him in a gracious and merciful way uh, there. Uh, uh, Jonah felt pity for only himself and the vine which the worm destroyed. So uh, God put him in a situation, made him, so he started feeling sorry for himself and pity for himself. Chapter 4, verse 9, And God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. And then, verse 10 and 11, Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither, neither made us the grow." which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? Uh, so God, uh, God uh, had pity. pity. Thank God that he has pity on us. When we need his pity, which leads to his mercy and his grace. And we all need his mercy and grace. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. 
We need that same grace. We need that same pity that God had for Nineveh. The, the barbaric people. But uh, if we just get a true glimpse of how sinful we are and how righteous God is, I'm telling you, our lives would change. Lord, help us, dear God, uh, to be preachers of your grace that we had ourselves have received, Lord. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. You're merciful. You're mighty, Lord. Dear God, as we look out in our world today, we see what we would say terrible sinners. But in essence, God, they're no more terrible than we are. Lord, we're all guilty. Lord, we all are like filthy rags, Lord. That's our righteousness. We need you. We need your grace, your mercy, your righteousness, Lord. Thank you for that. Fill us, dear God, with yourself. Forgive us our sin. Cleanse us, Lord. Help us, dear God, to be willing messengers of the gospel because it changed our lives. Now we want it to see it change other sinners' lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I uh, just want to talk a little bit first uh, study guide that you have there, uh, Harold L. Wilmington. Talk to you about him before, but uh, it was a man who has spent his whole life studying the Word of God in the Word of God. Okay. So uh, what, what great blessing and benefit you would get uh, from somebody's knowledge like that that's uh, researched and and those, and then we use a lot of Warren Wiersbe too, and there you go again, another great man of God, and the same same thing, and spent time just in the study of God's Word, so two wonderful servants of God that uh, devoted, devoted their life to, to God and the teaching of His Word. Uh, the great verse of Micah is, of course, Micah five two. But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, uh, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth. Now Micah was a contemporary with Isaiah, and Micah was, Micah was a country preacher, while Isaiah was a court preacher. Micah was God's final prophet to the northern kingdom. He was the only prophet sent to both the southern and northern kingdoms, especially ministering to their capitals, Jerusalem and Samaria. Quotation from the book of Micah may have saved the life of Jeremiah the prophet many years later, Micah 3.12, and uh, so beside Micah 3.12 there in your Bibles, right, uh, right there, Jeremiah 26, verse 16 through 18. So Micah 3.12 in, in the margin, Jeremiah 26, <coughs> verse 16 through 18. Micah was the first prophet to predict the Babylonian captivity and restoration of the southern kingdom. Chapter 4, verse 9, the book gives one of the most beautiful descriptions of the millennium in all the Bible. Chapter 4, verse 1 through 5, the words of chapter 7, 18 through 20 are read in the synagogues yearly on the Day of Atonement. Okay, so chapter 7, verse 18 through 20, you might want to write read in the synagogue yearly on the Day of Atonement. It's quoted from or alluded to 14 times by six New Testament uh, writers. Uh, so, uh, contemporary of Isaiah, and also Hosea. Uh, he gives us three messages, each introduced by a call to hear. He declared the coming judgment. Chapters 1 and 2, the future kingdom, chapters 3 through 5, and God's uh, invitation to the people to turn to the Lord, chapters 6 through 7. He hoped that the people of Judah uh, would learn from the sad experience of Israel, but they did not. 
and uh, his is a message of judgment mingled with mercy and hope. His name means who is like the Lord. Who is like the Lord. Uh, his public sermons proclaim the retribution upon Israel. Uh, first sermon, God himself would soon respond in judgment because of the sins found in Samaria and Jerusalem. Verse 1 through 5, chapter 1. Samaria, Samaria would be utterly destroyed. The sin of the city was terminal. Chapter 1, verse 9. The very foundation of its building would be uh, exposed. Chapter 1, verse 6. The idols would be thrown into the surrounding valley. Verse 7. And the enemy will come up the very gates of Jerusalem. Uh, verse 9. And the enemy will come up, but God would spare.